I'm Miriam Elman. I'm the executive director of AEN. And my colleagues in AEN's leadership team and I are really delighted that so many of our faculty members could join us here today. Some are longtime AEN members who joined AEN when our organization was founded um, six years ago. And many are new members as well. So I'd like to welcome also AEN supporters and funders who are with us today, as well as many of the members of our advisory board. A number of professionals of partner organizations are also in the audience and we're delighted to have you join us. And of course, All thank right, you, you so much Bye, to our six panel experts for giving us your time and for sharing your knowledge and insights with us today. Uh, so before I get started, just again, uh, just please keep yourself muted um, until the Q&A portion and you'll be able to ask questions and unmute yourself. Each speaker will present for about 10 minutes. I'll introduce them one by one as we go. Uh, the chat is enabled, so feel free to write questions or comments into the chat. And my colleagues and I will monitor the chat and we'll give each of you, uh, if we can, the opportunity to engage with our speakers after they present. Um, so as you saw, we are recording the event, but we will end the recording promptly at 1.30. That's when the official program will end, uh, but our panelists have kindly offered to hang around for an additional 15 minutes or so for some informal conversations. So with that being said, we will start with our first speaker, who is Oren Gross. Oren Gross is the Irving Younger Professor of Law at the University of Minnesota Law School. He is an internationally recognized expert in the areas of international law and national security law. He holds an LLB degree magna cum laude from Tel Aviv University and an LLM and SJD degrees from Harvard Law School. He has taught and held visiting positions in numerous leading institutions such as Harvard Law School and Princeton University. Professor Gross has received numerous academic awards and scholarships including a Fulbright Scholarship and British Academy and British Council Awards. And Oren will speak to us about the legal aspects of the recent conflict, including the laws of armed conflict. So Oren, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Miriam, and thank you all for uh, being here. Uh, I'm delighted to speak to you from, uh, from Tel Aviv, from home. Um, and I'm especially delighted to be involved in this program. I've been an AEN member uh, since the uh, very early days of the organization, and I'm very proud of my membership with this organization. I'm also uh, uh, very thankful to, uh, specifically to those of you that I know, and there are quite a number of you that I know that uh, have taken the time to be here. So uh, Miriam suggested that I'll uh, speak about the legal aspects, and there are so many of them. And I can't cover them in 10 minutes, which is usually my punt to Q&A. Uh, but what I want to do is really touch on some uh, issues. I'm not going to be exhaustive. Uh, we can't be exhaustive uh, in such a brief presentation. And what we've seen basically in the most recent conflict, we've seen this already in the past, but even more so now, is really the use of lawfare uh, against Israel. Uh, that is using terms and terminology of the law of armed conflict, terms and terminology that have very clear understandings to them, terms of art um, that uh, have been basically all but thrown out the window the minute that we are talking about Israel. And I wanna to touch on two of them, uh, two of probably the biggest principles of the law of war that is distinction and proportionality. And proportionality to some extent has been really the last refuge of the scoundrel uh, in the context of, of Israel. Um, so let me first of all kind of quickly just mention what those two are and then see how they were used. So when we are talking about distinction, the principle of distinction in international law, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be overly nuanced and overly technical, but to just try and give you the overall sense when we're talking about distinction, the idea is that thou shalt not directly and intentionally target civilian or civilian objects. Directly, intentionally target civilians or civilian objects. Note what this principle does not say. It does not say 
that you should finish a war with zero civilian casualties. No war ever had zero civilian casualties, right? When the United States in Kosovo uh, uh, came up with the principle or the policy of zero casualties, the idea was zero casualties to US uh, uh, fighter pilots, not zero casualties to civilians on the ground, right? No war ends with zero casualties. So clearly when we are talking about such euphemisms as collateral damage and others, the understanding is that some civilians may get harmed. And as long as they have not been harmed intentionally, directly targeted, but rather the harm to them was incidental to uh, the harm to combatants, to militants, that is okay. I'll come back uh, and say more about this uh, in a minute. And so, for example, I'll just remind you, right, and I'm sure you all remember the uh, front page of the New York Times, uh, right, with splashing the pictures of dead children. Now, let me, let me be clear. Every innocent civilian, a man, a woman, or a child, is a tragedy, right? But tragedies do happen. Now, when the New York Times puts uh, the pictures of the children, basically what they're saying is look at what Israel has been doing. Now note several things. Number one, I actually searched back. I could not find, for example, right, pictures on the front page of the New York Times of Afghani or Iraqi children killed by the US, uh, by Britain. Israel is fair game. No, by the way, by you know, Syria or other uh, 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 members of uh, the region. Um, but of course, plastering it there, right, is the New York Times way of saying Israel directly targeted civilian, not only directly targeted civilian, but directly targeted children, which of course, to uh, many of us should have invoked the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, old blood, li blood libel of Jews killing children, right? All you needed is another picture of a matzah on the front page, and it would have been uh, complete. Forget the fact, again, that many of those images were false images, that several of the older teens were actually Hamas members, right? None of this uh, was of interest. Forget the fact that several of them were killed by errant Hamas rockets. That was not the idea, right? The idea was that Israel directly targets. And it was connected to the second general principle, and that is the principle of proportionality, right? And we've heard many times that Israel's uh, use of force is disproportionate right, to Hamas's use of force. Now, again, proportionality is a term of art in law. And what proportionality says in the law of armed conflict is you should not engage in a military attack in which the anticipated harm to civilians is going to be excessive uh, compared to or in relation to the anticipated or expected military advantage. Again, I want to repeat this because it's really important. The anticipated harm to civilians judged by the facts that you have, by the information that you have, by the intel that you have, will not be excessive to the military advantage that you expect to have, right? Which again, the question is, how do you measure military advantage? Over 4,000 rockets were fired at Israel. Military advantage is not how many of your civilians, John Oliver, how many Israeli civilians were killed vis-a-vis -vis how many Palestinian civilians were killed. That's not the legal test. That's not the legal term, right? It's not how many of my civilians. It's what is the potential harm that their attacks could have caused but for the fact that I have engaged right in combat. And if again, the expected ex ante harm to civilians is not excessive vis-a-vis -vis the military advantage, that is permissible. Note by the way, that the word is excessive. Law does not say anything about extensive harm to civilians. That is, there are circumstances in which even an extensive harm to civilians might be okay. For example, if you bomb a nuclear reactor and as a result of that bombing, 100 or 200 civilians are killed, that might still be okay under the law of armed conflict 
if the expected military advantage is the destruction right, of a nuclear reactor. And as a result, you're not subject to nuclear attack. But now I want to just connect the two of those right, and kind of finish with a little hypo. Right? What, what do we do, professors, if not a little hypo? So I want to present to you three um, assumptions or three premises that I think none of us can challenge, right? Number one, Gaza is one of the densest areas as far as population is concerned in the world. Nobody finds this controversial. By the way, Bnei Brak might be more, but let's leave this aside, right? Gaza is one of the densest areas in the world. Number two, the IDF is one of the strongest and most advanced militaries in the world. I don't think anybody can dispute that. Number three, the IDF in those 11 days conducted over 1,000 airstrikes, plus add tank fire, plus artillery, right? So let's assume 1,000 air sorties over Gaza. Gaza is the, one of the densest. The IDF is a sophisticated uh, uh, military machine. You know what, let's add brutal, ruthless, Palestinian killing uh, a military machine and over a thousand sorties, right? And as John Oliver says famously, and I here I quote, Israeli airstrikes were not intercepted. They hit their targets. Now by Palestinians' own accords, by Hamas's own accords, there were about 230 casualties total in Gaza. Now, Israel says that about uh, 160 of them were terrorists. But you know what? For the heck of it, let's assume 230 were all innocent civilians. So let me ask you this. If the IDF, one of the most sophisticated militaries in the world, is bombing over a thousand soldiers, the one of the densest areas in the world, the numbers surely should have been significantly higher. Sorry. Unless one of two things. Either the IDF commanders, right, are completely incompetent, which goes against the grain of the second assumption, one of the most sophisticated armies in the world, or that the IDF actually attempts to um, somebody speaking together. Can with someone start? Uh, everyone mute their microphones, please. Thanks. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, and or right. The only other possibility is that the IDF actually cares about such things as distinction and proportionality. Miriam, how much time do I have, if at all? You have about one minute, one, one and a minute. half minutes. Okay, so let me let me just um, say one last thing, because that's something that that always kind of annoyed me when people have been talking about the conflict. Um, one of the things that you hear frequently, uh, and and by the way, you hear it on both sides, is that Hamas fires indiscriminately. You hear it on both sides. Because some are saying, well, if they're firing indiscriminately, so can we, right? That's one. Or Hamas fires indiscriminately, well, because they can't do anything else. They have rockets, right? That's the poor man's weapons. So let me just quickly, legally talk about both of these. Number one, the fact that Hamas fires indiscriminately is not an excuse to Israel to directly fire at civilians, right? The fact that they're not playing by the rules does not enable Israel not to play by the rules. But I wanna talk about the second part. And that is Hamas is firing indiscriminately well because that's what they can do. And here is a misconception. Hamas does not fire indiscriminately. Hamas fires intentionally and directly at Israeli civilians. There is nothing indiscriminate. Indiscriminate means that there's some sort of a recklessness about the outcome. There is no recklessness here. There's a very intentional idea about killing as many Israeli civilians as possible. But again, as I said, whether they're successful or not as a result of Iron Dome does not matter as far as the calculations of Israel. Even if, right, even if, they were not able to kill a single Israeli. They failed in all their missions. 
My argument, as I said earlier, is that if you follow the letter of the law, the IDF did follow both the principles of distinction and of proportionality. And I'm happy to say more about this in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oren. I've already have two pages of notes, um, so much appreciated. I want to turn to Donna Robinson Devine, who is the Morningstar Family Professor of Jewish Studies and Professor of Government Emerita at Smith College, where she taught a variety of courses on Middle East politics, able to draw on material in Hebrew, in Arabic, and in Turkish. She has numerous books on politics and society in Ottoman Palestine, on Zionism, on cross-cultural perspectives in the Middle East. She has served as a visiting professor at Harvard's Middle East Center, Yale University, the University of Sydney, the University of Hamburg, and the University of Geneva. Named the Catherine Asher Engel Lecturer at Smith College for 2012-13 academic year. In recognition of her scholarly achievements, she was also designated as Smith's Honored Professor for the Excellence of her teaching. She served as president of the Association for Israel Studies from 2017 to 2019, and is an affiliate professor at Israel's University of Haifa. And Donna will speak to us about Israeli political dimensions and various media fails. Donna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Miriam. And uh, thank you uh, to you and to the uh, staff at AEN for uh, inviting me to participate. Thank you, my fellow uh, panelists, for uh, allowing me to share the floor uh, with you. Uh, when the first rockets were fired by Hamas, the merchants of certitude in the mainstream media delivered the bold conclusion that this, what turned out to be an 11 day war, would strengthen. Netanyahu's position as Israeli prime minister and simultaneously not only unite Palestinians, but also confirm their backing for Hamas as leader of their national movement. Even swearing in a new prime minister has not fully dislodged this media meme as one after another newspaper or cable news uh, network proclaims Israel still belongs to Bibi. According to the tide swirling around Bibi, he, for, he was the person who forged a joint venture with Hamas to keep the Palestinian authority weak and unable to move ahead on peace negotiations that would have forced Israel to withdraw from the West Bank. Thus did Hamas during this conflict get what might be called the pop culture love. While Bibi was depicted as an Israeli copy of Trump, <clears throat> validating any hostility to any policy with his fingerprints. Now, why did this conflict emerge at this particular time? We know that part of it was the calendar, uh, the, co the simultaneous coincident coincidence of several Muslim and Jewish religious holidays, some national uh, commemorations uh, for Palestinian Arabs and for uh, uh, Israelis to mark the unification of uh, Jerusalem after the 67 war. There was also the uh, dispute over uh, the court case that was about to make it uh, to the Israeli uh, uh, Supreme Court. Uh, and, and this was, was described as a kind of metaphor for the Nakba and the dispersion of Palestinians that has haunted the politics of the Middle East. But we also uh, know that it was because of the cancellation of elections. But here I wanna talk about two kinds of elections. One, the cancellation of two elections by the Palestinian Authority, with the expectation that Hamas would have done fairly well at the uh, parliamentary level, established more influence formally uh, in Jerusalem and in the West Bank. Uh, and uh, the 
uh, uh, simultaneous uh, coincidence of four elections uh, for Israelis. Because I think both the cancellation of elections in one sector and the degree to which the, they're uh, uh, they've had to have, or there have been four elections with no decisive outcome in the Israeli uh, sector, uh, uh, brought together a kind of cauldron that uh, gave Hamas what it perceived as the opportunity to engage in violence uh, uh, in order to establish its strategic goals of leadership within the Palestinian movement and to take advantage of what were uh, disturbances in Jerusalem that were poorly uh, handled initially and also the outbreak of disturbances in the so-called mixed cities, Lud, Haifa, Akko, uh, Batyam, other places that were equally poorly handled. So let me uh, explain uh, a little about both and, and uh, draw some conclusions about the notion that that uh, the, the, the misconception uh, that came from the uh, conclusions drawn by the media. Uh, what, what has happened in Israel, I think, over the course of four elections and over the course of Bibi's attempt to retain the power of the prime ministership uh, is that Israel has had, number one, to operate without a budget, without a formal budget uh, for two years. And number two, that, Israel, that, that Bibi has pursued for his own personal reasons, has pursued his own policy of what we, we in the United States might call defund the police. That is, he has degraded uh, the capacity of the police force looking for loyalists instead of competent people um, to do the kind of job that uh, uh, circumstances have thrust upon it. That is the circumstances of the COVID, the circumstances of disturbances that always take place around uh, uh, Ramadan and different holidays. Uh, the fact that the space in Jer the sacred esplanade in Jerusalem stands over the Western Wall and is a tight space under any circumstances. Uh, the police in some of these mixed cities have, a, have for the past several years allowed gangs to operate in certain areas, have not intervened. And so you, you have a kind of set of criminal gangs that were able to take advantage of uh, the rumors that Al-Aqsa is in danger, the disturbances in Jerusalem, which always fire up antagonism that were poorly handled and uh, created an aura of, of uh, 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 Palestinian citizens of Israel, of, of Arab citizens of Israel really, uh, 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 challenging the legitimacy uh, of the state when so many Arab citizens have actually integrated and increased their integration. So it was a, a projection of what happened uh, to a great extent uh, because of the degradation of critical state institutions. And hence the, the change uh, uh, the, the swearing in of uh, the so-called change coalition is, is determined to focus on, on re-establishing the credibility of those institutions. Uh, 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 prime, the new prime minister, Naftali Bennett, said it, we're here to do work. And there's a lot that they share with regard to the operations and functioning uh, of the state. Let me say just a few words in my last few minutes <laughs> uh, 
about uh, the notion that Hamas now leads uh, uh, the Palestinian cause, the Palestinian movement. It is true that on social media and to some extent when you do uh, quick surveys of opinion, Hamas stood up to the Israelis. It thinks, uh, uh, it thinks of itself as a victor in what it calls the sword of Jerusalem uh, uh, conflict. Um, but you don't build a nationalist movement that does things, that gets something done, that achieves concrete aims on social media. Uh, the social, by the way, the, the Western media, CNN and cable news, made the same mistake about the Arab Spring. You get a lot of people who are savvy about social media and sound the right and give the right sound bites, and you could think there's a deep movement that has established procedures to sort out differences, because there are differences, even within the Palestine Authority. What does this mean about uh, uh, going forward? Uh, there have been a lot of comments about the need for reconstruction and rehabilitation in Gaza that would avoid um, putting the funds in the hands of Hamas, uh, uh, sort of strengthening the Palestine Authority in some ways as uh, 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 an entity that could control some of the funds. This is not an easy task. Uh, what is true of uh, the Gaza Strip, if you look at the last uh, uh, several decades, if you look at the 70 plus years since the establishment of Israel is no one wanted to take a lot of time, money, or pour a lot of resources into Gaza. Gaza was a sort of the, uh, uh, the added burden. And uh, possibly there, the, uh, the international co community could convince Egypt to take it seems to be taking more initiative, but whoever takes the initiative is going to skim off the top. And now maybe it's useful to Egypt at this point to skim off the top to control the dispersion of funds. It's it's not clear, but it's not you 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 can project uh, a, a lot of nice sounding. Uh, uh, slogans or nice sounding aims and goals without understanding the difficulty of actually meeting those goals and the time it's going to take to meet those goals. I'll stop there. I'm happy to go into anything you'd want. Thank you so much, Donna. That was so rich in, in literally just 10 minutes. Um, so outstanding. Um, I, I want to turn to Richard, Richard Landis. Uh, Richard is a historian living in Jerusalem. Uh, he maintains a blog, uh, critical of Western journalism, uh, called the um, Aegean Stables. He has a book manuscript in press, uh, Can the Whole World Be Wrong? A Medievalist's Guide to the Millennial Wars of the 21st Century, which will be out this year with Academic Studies Press. And you can find him on Twitter, uh, despite Donna saying that social media isn't everything. Um, uh, uh, Richard is, uh, uh, does very well on Twitter. Uh, so I encourage you to follow him at Richard uh, underline Landis. Uh, Richard, the floor is yours. And you will speak on Jerusalem dimensions and the cognitive war. Go ahead. Okay, so thank you. Um... Uh, w one thing I want to say about Oren's presentation, which was uh, very valuable for me because I had never actually heard the, the definitions, but um, I think that when Hamas um, has about 600 of its rockets land in Gaza, that can be called reckless. Um, and at the beginning, most of the civilian and child casualties were from uh, Hamas rockets that landed in Gaza or exploded on site because uh, the uh, exploded on site um, before the Israelis even started firing. Um, what I'd like to do here is to discuss uh, a terminology that I've developed uh, for the cognitive war, 
um, which uh, the Palestinians are conducting uh, through the media. Um, cognitive war is uh, generally a war that's conducted by the weaker side in an asymmetrical conflict. That's clearly the Palestinians here. And it's basically done in order to, as uh, my friend Ron Schleifer here says, to make patriots of your own side or fanatic warriors of your own side on the one hand and uh, to make pacifists of your enemy. Um, the cognitive war that the Palestinians have been conducting with enormous success, uh, in particular since 2000, is to start fights with the Israelis in which they suffer much more than the Israelis. They know they can't win, but they are going to win in the world of public opinion, and they will be able to leverage that uh, public opinion to their advantage uh, in the lawfare and the various uh, international arenas in which they want to move against Israel to isolate it. Um, now, so I, I've developed terminology for three types of war journalism. There's patriotic war journalism, which is where you run the propaganda of your own side, even if it's not true, um, as part of your patriotic participation in the war effort. And modern journalism uh, considers that unacceptable. So, for example, there was a lot of criticism of the American press for um, not questioning, uh, well, for example, the Bush insistence on weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Um, even the New York Times apparently supported that uh, back in an era when the New York Times wasn't what it's become. Um, so that's patriotic war journalism and it's not acceptable. Um, the second kind of war journalism is what I call lethal war journalism, and that is when you take the side of your, of, you take one side in an external war. So if you're covering, let's say, some war in Africa, and you side with one side, and you report the war propaganda of the one side against the other as news, that is lethal journalism. And I, I take that term uh, from Nidra Polar, who coined the term lethal narrative. And it, that's particularly relevant, for instance, to the front page of the New York Times, which is a, a lethal narrative is something that you say, even though it's not true, which even when it's disproven, unless it's radically disproven, um, you're sunk. So you say Israel killed 65 kids, we say, well, three of them were members of Hamas and eight to 12 of them were killed by Hamas. And they say, OK, so it's 50, but still you killed 50 kids. And uh, it happened at Kafar Kana in, uh, in the Lebanon war in 2006. Um, Israeli strike hits children's home, you know, 93 dead. And then it turns out that uh, it was 50 and most of them weren't kids and it wasn't a kid's home, but the damage was already done. So that's lethal journalism. And journalists in particular, I mean, I, I dated back to um, the Lebanon civil war, but in particular uh, since 2000, journalists have engaged in a particularly vicious campaign of lethal journalism against Israel, reporting Palestinian claims as credible news, um, reporting Israeli denials uh, lightly and treating them as propaganda, and then when it turns out Israel is correct, moving on to the next thing. So, for example, the, the, the Guardian was particularly vicious about the Jenin uh, massacre. Um, and when it proved not to be a massacre, they didn't correct. And in fact, there was an article sent to them, uh, which they refused to publish. And then just before this, uh, this conflict, they actually published a list of, you know, it was 150 years of the Guardian, and they listed all the, mis the major mistakes they had made. Well, Jenin was not a major mistake that was listed, but, the approval of the Balfour Declaration was something that they now regret and they think was a mistake. 
So essentially not correcting an actual uh, professional failure um, and, and therefore acting as if it were true leads them to change their editorial moral opinion of uh, the Balfour Declaration. So all of that are good examples. Now, the last category that I want to discuss, and that's the category I think we're, we're dealing with now in a really frightening way, is um, what I call own goal war journalism. Own goal is for soccer fans when you score a goal against your own team. And I define own goal journalism as journalism in which you report your enemy's propaganda as news. Now, most of the lethal journalists here and most of their audience in the West didn't understand that the Hamas and Al Qaeda and um, ISIS and uh, Hezbollah, et cetera, et cetera, and Khomeini are all, they may dislike each other, they may compete for, uh, for members and so on, for recruits, but they are all part of what I call a, a millennial movement that I call the Caliphaters, which is to inaugurate um, a global caliphate in this generation. Um, and so for example, when the Janine reports of massacre came out in 2002, there were demonstrations in Europe where one in Madrid in particular, and if anybody has pictures of this, I'd love it, uh, there were models who wore nothing but suicide belts to show their solidarity with the people and with the weapon that was going to be turned on them. Um, it had already been turned on America. Uh, but People thought, oh, well, America and Israel, they deserve it. We Europeans don't because we're siding with the Palestinians. They had no clue. So they had no idea that they were literally cheering on their enemies. And that's the result of this own goal journalism. Now, it's been going on for 20 years. This time, what struck me the most was that Israel has become incredibly sophisticated, as Oren pointed out, in not uh, killing civilians. Um, this is a remarkable, uh, you know, I'm still waiting for the Mayer uh, Institute of Terrorist uh, Research to come up with their account of how many people were killed and who were civilians and so on, because you certainly can't trust, can't trust um, uh, the Hamas-run uh, Ministry of Health. But in any case, certainly in the opening days, you know, the, the, it was like unheard of. It was like four, ca four combatants to one civilian. Um, so this was really remarkable. And yet the knee-jerk response of the West was immediately to engage in both lethal journalism and, I would say, um, own goal journalism. That is that they were literally reporting they were siding with Hamas. And, and that, that's it just, I mean, it's literally astonishing to think that you've got a situation where the West sides, and we have these statements from alleged scholars and academics that were just propaganda statements that could have been written by the Palestinian Ministry of Propaganda um, and that were taken not only as statements of solidarity but with Hamas, but as basic approaches to what we should be teaching in the classroom. So in a sense, we're, we're, we're now in a situation where the West has become literally, I mean, misinformed is the wrong term. They've literally been utterly disoriented, both morally and cognitively. And that New York Times page was in particular striking because it came at a time when the demonstrations against Israel were spilling out into violence in the streets in the very city the New York Times publishes from. Now, up until now, that kind of stuff started in 2000, and it with the Mohammed Adoua story, that stuff started in France and in 2014 was all over Europe, but wasn't yet in the United States. Now we literally, after the, the summer demonstrations uh, uh, after uh, Floyd's death, um, 
we literally have a situation in which we have jihadi bands roaming the streets and attacking Jews in the United States. And the New York Times actually literally took Palestinian propaganda handed to them by a pro-Palestinian organization and ran it on their front pages at the very moment that this kind of reporting was bringing on violence. And I think that one of the things that tells us about the New York Times, which Barry Weiss had already alerted us to, one of the things that tells us about the New York Times is that literally it's been taken over. It's not even a question of, you know, well, we think we're doing a good job. At this point, we're doing a propaganda job. That's our, that's what we, we're, that's what we're here to do. And, and given that situation, um, you know, I, I've actually been saying this since I started working, uh, writing at the OG and Sables and, and working on this stuff. Um, the media are our eyes and ears and any animal, even a Tyrannosaurus Rex, who is blinded, can't see his enemies and is told to attack his friends is in terrible shape. You know, you can't survive no matter how big and strong you are. You cannot survive if you can't see clearly. So I see the loss of the New York Times and of the mainstream media who literally make Hamas's cannibal strategy of sacrificing their own people for the sake of a PR victory possible. I see that as a, a, a massive catastrophe for democracy and civil society. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, um, Richard. It's very disturbing, very distressing. Um, and, and, and hopefully there's a, a lot of people are writing in the chat now on all the presentations. Again, we will be saving the chat and we'll be able to continue the conversation um, uh, at the end and even after this program. <laughs> um, let me return, let me turn now to um, Eli Reches. Um, Ellie is the Crown Visiting Professor for Israel Studies uh, at Northwestern University. He's one of Israel's leading experts on the Arab minority in Israel and on Jewish Arab relations and Palestinian politics uh, and the Islamic resurgence uh, in Israel, the West Bank and Gaza. Until his retirement in 2011, he served as a senior research fellow in the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern and African Studies at Tel Aviv University. And he headed the program on Jewish Arab cooperation in Israel sponsored by the Conrad Adnauer Stiftung from 1995 to 2010. And Ellie will be speaking about the troubling violence that erupted between Arabs and Jews in Israel last month, its significance for Israeli democracy and for pluralism. So Ellie, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Miriam, and um, hello, everybody. Thank you for the initiative. It's nice to have everybody together to deal, unfortunately, with this uh, unfortunate course of events. Um, I will be speaking on the Arab minority in Israel, and uh, what I'll try to do is look at the causes mostly, and <clears throat> if I have enough time, maybe draw some uh, conclusion or, or summaries. But first, let me start, begin by saying that when you look at the commentaries and the uh, uh, responses that uh, are published nowadays, you tend to see some sort of a um, dichotomy, uh, di uh, dichom dichotomy in, in the way things are interpreted, uh, laying the blame either on the Arab side or on the Jewish side. But the, the, the issue is much, much more uh, complex. And I believe that the causes are deeply rooted in contradictory trends. Uh, and that underlying the riots that we all know what, what happened are diametrically opposed processes. One that relates to the civic aspect of the integration of the Arabs in Israel, uh, simplistically put, Israelization, and the other to the national alienation uh, of the uh, Arabs or Palestinians in Israel, uh, uh, process known as Palestinization. Uh, now, let me deal with the first one, the integration, which, as I said, is complex. Uh, on the one hand, what we have seen 
th this outburst occurred after a prolonged uh, period of improvement in the state's relations to its Arab Palestinian citizens. A, a growing desire on the Arab uh, side to integrate into Israeli society. Uh, the last two decades, uh, we, we have been witnessing uh, expressions of incorporation, the rise of a middle class in the Arab sector, uh, which had a vested socioeconomic interest uh, to fulfill its quote unquote Israeliness. Um, uh, the, the integration of Arabs into the health system, uh, to the high tech, uh, I, I don't have time to, to elaborate on that. Then you have the political pragmatism, uh, which uh, has not culminated, it has culminated uh, with the United Arab List incorporation into the um, coalition, but had earlier uh, signs, uh, recognition uh, by the country's leadership uh, of the importance of encouraging and promoting integration, political integration, and eagerness on the Arab side uh, to join the uh, decision uh, making process uh, at the national level. And we have seen uh, Hadash uh, for one or two, I, I no longer recall, elections um, um, recommending to the president that Benny Gantz will be uh, the person who uh, formed the government. Of course, nothing came out of it, but this was a significant move that was well recorded in the Arab sector. And of course, the United Arab East. I should add that at the same time, my feeling is, even though I haven't been the service yet, I'm sure service will come out, uh, that the majority of the Jewish public uh, wants proper relations with the Arab minority. And this has been obvious in the last couple of years. Now the bad news. Uh, concurrently, the socioeconomic status of the Arab uh, population is, uh, is far from being rosy. Uh, the reality involves uh, pervasive uh, discrimination, uh, which is seen in, in so many, and gaps in so many fields. Let me just enumerate some of these <clears throat> areas. Uh, significant socioeconomic gaps. Uh, the percentage of Arabs uh, who are under the poverty line is, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, a uh, triple time those uh, of the Jews, particularly within uh, children. Uh, Arab schools receive uh, less funding. Uh, issues of infrastructure, housing, uh, urban development. No uh, Arab city has been, uh, if I'm not mistaken, established in, in the last uh, decades or so, while compared to the Jewish side. The younger generation, I think, uh, who, who were the main carriers of this outburst of, of anger and frustration, yes, uh, many of those have uh, no horizons. Uh, the number of university graduates reaches you know, 70, 80,000, and uh, uh, not many of them are involved, uh, are employed in work in, in the areas that uh, they study. There are internal issues within the Arab society, problems of Arab, gov Arab governance of the local um, uh, authorities. Um, insufficient uh, financial and organizational um, conduct, uh, hard to implement uh, government grants, even the uh, decision number 922, uh, which uh, was supposed to be granting 15 uh, billion shekels uh, over a five year period, uh, was difficult to implement uh, because of this situation. And finally, one additional element, the organized crime in the Arab sector, a topic that is much discussed and has reached heights unparalleled to the Jewish uh, sector. Uh, the illegal weapons that, that uh, exist are gathered in the Arab sector, Arab and Druze sector, I should add, are really uh, uh, amazing. Now, all of this together uh, constitutes one uh, contradictory, as, as I said, uh, cause for the outburst. Uh, paradoxically so, as an expression of Israelization, which leads me to the kind of opposite, even though I'm not accurate in that, the process of Palestinization that I had the dubious honor of coining, I don't know how many years ago. Uh, so, so what happened here? Uh, alongside a diminished focus 
on national issues that we have been observing in the last decade or so. Uh, the nationalist overtones of what happened cannot be uh, downplayed or uh, downtoned. Um, the discourse of self-identity as part of the Palestinian national collective is there, live and kicking. Uh, with all due respect to Israelization, these are the Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel. Uh, we don't have time to analyze the process. It has been going on and has intensified uh, since the 70s due to a variety of reasons and has not disappeared. Uh, we could have seen it in landmarks, the uh, vision documents of 2007 and so forth and so forth. But the important thing is the following. And I've said it when the October 2000 uh, riots uh, began. If a match is being thrown on the Al-Aqsa compound, Nazareth goes on fire. And this is exactly what happened here. Temple Mount problems, Sheikh Jarrah issues, Hamas involvement, all of these gave rise to a existing sense of uh, collectiveness of being part of the Palestinian collective. Um, and, uh, and, and it's there particularly with the younger uh, uh, generation. So this is the second uh, major cause. I would add now one additional element, and this is the um, trend that we see of radicalization within the Jewish uh, sector it is in, Israel, in Israel, the process of radicalization radicalization that began in recent years, uh, reflected on in, in the strengthening of the right, of the extreme right, right wing. And one of their themes uh, is the delegitimization of uh, the Arab minority in Israel. Uh, it had various expressions by politicians as well. Again, I don't have time to look into it, but um, it was so, it did, the, the, the element of delegitimization is not unsupported by several or certain uh, political leaders uh, in Israel. Incitement on social media, death to the Arabs, etc., etc. Kahani's groups popped up. They showed up during the disturbances. Uh, among them, uh, groups like La Familia. I know that we're not dealing with Sicily now, but uh, La Familia is. Is, is, is a group that live and existed, Lehava, and they went into the mixed cities of Jaffa, Ramna, and Lod, um, accompanied by the West Bank uh, uh, hilltop uh, youth. So this was a bad uh, combination, taking the law into their hands. So uh, I am almost 10 minutes. Um, may, do I still have uh, two more minutes, maybe to say a few concluding remarks, Miriam? Two minutes, two minutes is fine. Ellie, Two go minutes ahead. is fine. So uh, I'm an optimist, and I believe in the strong basis of Jewish Arab life together. I don't want to use the word coexisting. Coexisting has become a derogatory term. Uh, but as Miriam said, I've been involved in Jewish Arab relations for many years, and I believe that the basis is strong. And I believe that most of the Arab public still wants to integrate into the Israeli society, to the Israeli economy. To, the, to Israeli politics and to Israel culture as well. Um, and since this coexistence, pardon me, between Jews and Arabs is an established fact, um, I think it's an opportunity to bridge uh, rifts. And this requires both top-down and bottom-down efforts from the state on the one hand, but also from uh, the leadership, Jewish and Arab alike, uh, from the two societies. In practical terms, there is a, one need not reinvent the wheel. I do not want to tell you on how many committees I have been sitting and how many papers I was engaged in writing on what to do. Everything is on paper. The problem is how to carry it out. Um, I have some more uh, points to say, but maybe I'll stop here and leave it for the Q&A uh, period. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you so much for walking us through the trends and the developments, um, helping us to understand the issues 
and also um, uh, ending on an optimistic note um, with some practical um, solutions that are manipulable and, and potentially doable. Much appreciated. Um, I want to turn to um, Chuck Freelich, who um, is one of our newest AN members. So welcome, Chuck, and thank you for joining us today and, and in AN. Uh, Chuck is a former deputy national security advisor in Israel and longtime senior fellow at Harvard's Belfer Center. He teaches political science at Columbia, NYU, and Tel Aviv universities. He's the author of Zion's Dilemmas, How Israel Makes National Security Policy, published by Cornell in 2012, and Israeli National Security, A New Strategy for an Era of Change, published by Oxford in 2018. And he has a forthcoming book out on cyber threats. Uh, he has published numerous academic articles, um, hundreds of op-eds, and appears frequently on US, Israeli, and international TV and radio shows. And Chuck will talk to us a little bit about Israel's larger national security policy, the likely fallout of the May hostilities, the impact on regional peace efforts. So go ahead, Chuck, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, uh, thanks Miriam for, and the AEN for hosting what is I think a very, very important um, conference today. I think Israel, faces a near, perf near perfect storm of domestic and foreign crises. We are in the midst of an ongoing legal, political crisis, the worst in Israel's history, stemming from Mr. Netanyahu's no holds, uh, no, no holds bars attempt to stay in office, to stay out of jail, and now maybe to return to office. A severe economic crisis stemming from the COVID crisis, a socio-political crisis. And we saw in the last year, the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox and the Arab populations, I would say being almost out of control, violating fundamental health regulations and other laws, horrific violence just a few weeks ago between Jews and Arabs in Israel, severe danger of violence between Jews and Jews within Israel. And Israel was approaching a point of anarchy. I think we have a respite from it at the moment, but the problem is not over. Now, let me step back a minute and uh, give some good news, which is that I believe that Israel's national security strategy has actually been a dramatic success. And that Israel is today an established state, a prosperous one. I'm putting aside the temporary economic crisis due to COVID and an essentially secure state. Now, when I say essentially secure, that doesn't mean that there, isn't, there aren't a lot of severe threats out there. There are, I will come back to that in a minute. But it does mean that I believe that Israel won its existence. No one can destroy us anymore. And that's a phenomenal achievement. There are no existential threats today. And unless Iran goes nuclear, there won't be. And even that we can handle. There are no significant conventional threats today. The Iraqi and Syrian militaries, the primary threats that the IDF was built to address were devastated by the civil wars in those countries. As a matter of fact, the greatest threat that the Arab countries pose to Israel today is actually not Iran, Arab countries, is from their weakness, not their strength. The Abraham Accords were, I believe, a historic breakthrough an historic change in the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict, indeed in the history of the region. Israel has never been stronger. Our adversaries, with the exception of Iran, never weaker. And I think that we face an opportunity to make some of the critical decisions that we have to make as a state from a position of strength. But here's the bad news. I said major military threats remain and military power remains the fundamental basis for Israel's national security for lack of choice. The changing nature of warfare is such that the utility of military force has diminished, not just for Israel. I think we are reaching or have reached the limits of what we can achieve through military force. I don't believe that there are good offensive solutions to any of the major challenges that we face, at least at a price we're willing to pay. And the even worse news is that there may not be any good diplomatic solutions. Iran, I believe, is the most dangerous adversary that Israel has ever faced. 
It is carefully calculating. It is big. It is far away. It's the first adversary that we may not be able to defeat. We can defend ourselves successfully, but I don't think we can defeat Iran. So far, we've done a reasonably good job of limiting Iran's entrenchment in Syria and the transfer of advanced weapon systems to Hezbollah. But I believe that it is an uphill battle and ultimately probably a losing battle. The next war with Hezbollah, if and when it takes place, will lead to unprecedented destruction on Israel's home front, somewhere between 130 and 150,000 rockets aimed at us. Now, I'd much rather be in Israel than on the Lebanese side of the border when it happens, but still that's of little solace to anyone. The nuclear program continues apace. As a matter of fact, Iran is much closer to a nuclear capability today than it was when President Trump withdrew from the agreement and Iran's cyber uh, capability is growing rapidly. Iran played an important role in the outbreak of the recent fighting. Some rockets, mostly the technology for Hamas's um, homegrown rockets, provided operational guidance during the fighting. And I think maybe most importantly, or very importantly, I think they helped Hamas come up with this new equation whereby they link everything that happens in Jerusalem to rocket fire. And what they're trying to do is to create the same kind of equation that Hezbollah unfortunately did succeed in creating in Lebanon. Whereas if we attack any of their uh, positions or capabilities in Lebanon, they will immediately attack Israel with rockets. And the truth is we have not launched, with one exception, we haven't launched an attack in, um, in Lebanon, I think since uh, the 2006 war. In Syria, yes, but not in Lebanon. They succeeded in creating a balance of, of power. And that's what Hamas with Iranian uh, help is trying to do as well. Today's talk was billed as a retrospective. There's nothing retrospective about this. For the last three days, there have been incendiary balloons every day, just by chance, the first three days of the new government. We are one bad balloon or one rocket away from the next round, which could literally break out any second now. The conflict demonstrated the fact that those who thought that the Palestinian issue can simply be shunted aside and ignored, well, no, that's not the case. It can't, and to the extent that we try to do it, it has and will continue to erupt every few years. The polls show that Hamas has achieved a great boost in its popularity as a result of the last round and a huge boost in its the way it's positioning itself for the future um, leadership battle for leadership of the Palestinian Authority. I think there are signs of overconfidence there and maybe a tendency to take unnecessary risks. The new government can maybe keep a lid on things for a while, for a few weeks, for a few months, maybe. It's very hard for them politically, given the internal contradictions. Sooner or later, it's going to erupt. Hamas succeeded in firing 4,400 rockets at us in 11 days. Comparatively few people killed. 13 is 13 far too many, but comparatively few. They severely disrupted life in Israel. They created the linkage that I mentioned between Gaza and Jerusalem. They've become the defenders of Al-Aqsa, of the, of, the, of the mosque. They helped incite riots in Israel and in the West Bank. And they helped expose uh, helped expose a growing rift between Israel and the US, which I will come back to in a minute. The IDF demonstrated even stronger and more, preci more precise capabilities than in the past, caused significant damage to the tunnel system, to the rocket manufacturing capabilities, prevented Hamas from conducting any other forms of offensive action against Israel, and provided truly remarkable defense via Iron Dome. But no surprises here, victory cannot be achieved just from the air, and you cannot win wars through defense alone. Uh, the problem is we're not winning offensively at the moment either. Now, the rift, I believe a looming crisis in US-Israeli relations 
didn't start with Gaza. It's been in the making for a long time. And it's especially been in making for the last, let's say three years. We have seen a precipitous drop on the democratic side, especially the more liberal progressive side, which is also where most of the Jewish community is located. Now, if there's one issue that keeps me up at night, one issue that I'm really worried about, this is it. I believe that the relationship with the United States is existential for, for Israel. Somehow we'll get by with Iran, Hezbollah, et cetera. We cannot allow ourselves to face the significant de deterioration in the relationship with the United States. Part of the problem is that we simply cannot get our message across in the United States anymore for a variety of reasons that I can talk about if people want in the Q&A. Now, another thing that I can talk about in the Q&A is what are the options for trying to reach a long-term solution in Gaza? I don't think there are any good ones, which means that even though the government and the IDF announced that what was will no longer be, in other words, the last operation was supposed to bring about a significant change. In the final analysis, we are back to crisis or conflict management. That's not a good place for us to be because Hamas firing on our civilians is not acceptable. It's bad for our international standing, bad for deterrence, bad for the economy. It's bad for Israeli societal resilience. Having said that, national security is a choice between available options and very often bad options. Well, that's the least, to my way of thinking, that is the least of the bad options. Quite simply, how many people have we lost um, to the ongoing rocket fire? The answer is not very many. Uh, there's been a great psychological toll for people who live in the Gaza region, but then compare that to the number of guys that we will lose in a ground operation, which is the only way to achieve any significant change on the ground. So for me, ongoing management is the best, of the, the best of the bad options and a relatively easy choice. Well, what can we do to manage the option, to manage the conflict? And first of all, try and stabilize the ceasefire, allowing in immediate humanitarian aid, showing military restraint to the extent that we can. But then not only, we can establish equations also, not just Hamas and Hezbollah, and the equation that we should establish, I call rockets for reconstruction. So humanitarian aid, yes, but reconstruction aid, long-term economic growth in, in Gaza in exchange for an, in, an intrusive monitoring mechanism to prevent a, re, a buildup of their rocket force to prevent further expansion of the tunnel network. We can take a variety of measures to try and strengthen the TPA as our partner, because the policy of the last decade was to promote the separation between the West Bank and Gaza and actually keep Hamas, a weaker Hamas, but keep Hamas in power. I believe that's a mistake. We should try and strengthen the PA and it's not really up to us, but we can help them a little, maybe in the long run, reassert control in Gaza, there are various measures to that end. And let me conclude on a, on a positive note. The new government is, I believe, uh, speaking now as a political scientist, is a, a unique attempt to restore moderation, normalcy, unity, civility into Israeli political life. It's an opportunity for a national reset. And while it is by no means a done deal, there is some reason for optimism. And one way or the other, yeah, besedu, we'll get through it. Thank you. Miriam, are you there? I believe that's Miriam. Um, Looks like we lost Miriam. So I think uh, 
Andy, you're the last speaker, so maybe- I am the last speaker. Let me give her 30 seconds to find to her way back. back. If, if not, I can, I can introduce you, Andy. Okay, um, I can just go. Or, or, you can, or you can just go and say a few words about yourself, yes. Uh, okay, well, my name is Andrew Pesson, that's all I'll say. Uh, and of course, it's an honor to be part of this panel and an honor to be on the same panel as uh, my esteemed colleagues here. Um, I, I was asked to talk about the impact on campus and uh, I have only bad, no, that's not true, mostly bad news. I have, there's a tiny bit of good news I could talk about in the Q and A, but even that good news I think is ultimately bad news. So I think I only have bad news. So at a time when the genocidal terrorist group, Hamas has started yet another war by raining hundreds and then thousands of rockets down on Israeli men, women, and children. And at a time when Jews were literally being physically assaulted in the streets, synagogues being vandalized and burned, stores being smashed in major cities in North America and Europe, the academy erupted in protest against Israel. Faculty, students, staff, alums, the academy en masse. According to the BDS umbrella group, PACB, the Palestinian Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, as of several weeks ago, they announced that more than 300 academic departments, programs, centers, unions, and societies had put out statements of solidarity with Palestinians, which were filled with, as Richard put it earlier, just pure Palestinian propaganda, the most heinous lies, distortions, misrepresentations, not even half, but quarter truths, and with massive essential omissions of fact and context, uh, accusing Israel of the usual sins of genocide, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, state violence, targeting civilians, including children, targeting infrastructure, et cetera. That 300 number is probably uh, conservative. The list continued to grow even over the past few weeks. And indeed, just this past week, three weeks after the ceasefire, uh, a few new entries, um, the City University of New York, a labor union representing some 30,000 faculty and staff passed an anti-Israel resolution condemning Israel's quote, brutal ongoing settler colonial violence, apartheid and crimes against humanity. And they passed this with 72% voting in favor, thus joining teachers unions in San Francisco, Los Angeles and Seattle amongst other places that passed similar resolutions. So to this past week, the Middle East section of the American Anthropological Association, no surprise, held a referendum to endorse a boycott resolution that passed with 94% in favor with over 70% of the membership participating in the vote. So to this past week, the University of Oregon student government sent a statement to the entire student body accusing Israel not merely of apartheid, apartheid but quote, actively committing genocide. So here we have just in these three examples, not merely professors, faculty members, individuals, but an entire professional union of faculty members and staff, a whole section of an academic professional association and a student government. These join the literally hundreds, as I mentioned, of other statements and resolutions from faculty groups of different sorts and interests, including entire departments and programs from student governments almost without limit um, from student newspapers and even the University of California academic press got in on the action. To just give you a sense of the scale, the sheer scale of these, uh, letters with hundreds or thousands of signatures each were put out under the rubric of, uh, in the name of, um, and this is a small sample, Harvard, Yale, Georgetown, Princeton, Columbia, Brown, Stanford, University of Washington, and Rutgers. The Harvard letter had, was signed by over 100 student groups and over 900 students. The Columbia letter had over a thousand signatures. The Brown letter had about a thousand when last I checked. Student governments at places such as University of Chicago, University of Michigan, Northwestern, Vanderbilt, Scripps College, UC Davis put out similar statements. And then the, the various groups, Middle East librarians, NYU faculty, students, and alum of color, eight entire departments at the University of California Davis, including Asian American studies, American studies, gender studies, even French and Italian got in on this one. Uh, UCLA's um, um, uh, Department of Asian American Studies, 400 academics from quote, North Carolina universities, um, editors of the Middle East Journal of Culture and Communication, the American Studies Association, along with six specific departments of American studies. Um, and of course, um, over 150 entire departments and programs of women's and gender studies put out a collective statement, including the National Association of Women's Studies, 
even Stockton University Holocaust Studies Program put out an anti-Israel statement. Crossing the pond, just quickly, uh, University of Antwerp, over 1,800 people signed uh, such a statement. In the Netherlands, 500 academics. London School of Economics, over 500 signatures on a similar statement. University of Cambridge, more than 1,600 students and student societies and professors uh, signing a statement. And lest we for forget, let they be left out, scholars of Jewish and Israel studies, approximately 200, and by my count, um, signed a, a really awful statement condemning Israel. So that's a little sense of the, of the quantity of the scope, but what's even worse is um, the quality, the downright viciousness and hatred that comes across in these documents that are written by and for and endorsed by academics. It's not merely that they're filled, as I mentioned, with you know, distortions, misrepresentations, lies, uh, um, essential omissions, et cetera. It's that they're no longer even trying. They're not even trying or pretending to be academic. So I thought I would work through just a couple of the statements from a couple of representative ones to give a sense of that. So I'll focus on the Brown University statement since I live in, live in Providence and was signed by some people I know. Um, as the rockets were raining down on Israeli heads, Brown faculty, students, and alumni said, quote, we condemn Israel's incessant efforts to dispossess and displace 28 Palestinian families in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood in Jerusalem in order to replace them with Israeli settlers. The recent attempted expulsions are part of Israel's longstanding project of ethnic cleansing and dispossession, end quote. Now, I know this audience knows the facts here, so I don't have to go through them, but in brief, a private dispute between landlords and non-rent paying tenants here becomes a national government effort to dispossess and replace. For the record, the Muslim population of Jerusalem has increased some 600%, according to what I looked up, in the nearly six decades since Israel reunified the city. And the Arab population of the West Bank has increased some 350%. So whatever is happening there, ethnic cleansing, it isn't. Quote, we condemn the continued bombardment and murder of at least 145, as of May 17th, Palestinian men, women, and children in Gaza, the displacement of Palestinians um, as a result of the offense, and the systematic and deliberate destruction of Gaza's infrastructure already debilitated by a decades-long blockade, end quote. No mention here of the reason for the bombardment, Israeli efforts to stop the rockets being fired, no distinction between civilians and militants, nor of the documented fact, as Oren was telling us about earlier, that Israel goes to great lengths and expense to target militants and minimize civilian casualties, no mention facts that we heard earlier of Hamas rockets falling short, no evidence is given for the blood libelous claim of systematic and deliberate destruction of infrastructure, and so on. So this audience knows how all of that goes. One more, quote, we condemn the Israeli police ruthless attacks on Muslim worshipers in Al-Aqsa Mosque with rubber bullets, stun grenades, and tear gas canisters during the holy month of Ramadan, end quote. No mention here of the fact that during Ramadan, literally hundreds of thousands of Muslims worship peacefully at Al-Aqsa, that only in Israel is there anything resembling religious freedom in the Middle East. The true religious discrimination in Israel is found only in the extensive restrictions forbidding Jews from praying on their holiest site. Um, and no mention of the fact that the so-called raid was in response to violent riots being perpetrated by the worshipers and so on. Um, so you get the idea, no effort to be fair or balanced or scholarly, right? This is pure propaganda. This is what we might call lethal academia to borrow uh, uh, Richard's uh, memorable phrase uh, and that there's no effort. And this is the scary part. There's no effort, but they're proud of it. They openly enthusiastic, enthusiastically embrace the one-sidedness. So for example, the gender studies departments in solidarity with Palestinian feminist collective contain the following passage. And this passage was mirrored in many, many of the statements, which indicates this was overall a coordinated, organized effort. Someone had a template and was distributing it. We should figure out more about what happened there. But they wrote, quote, we do not subscribe to a both sides rhetoric that erases the military, economic, media, and global power that Israel has over Palestine. This is not a conflict that is too controversial and complex to assess. Israel is using violent force, punitive bureaucracy, and the legal system to expel Palestinians from their rightful homes and remove Palestinian people from their land, end quote. Never mind the grave assault on reason here when signatories in women's studies and gender studies side with Hamas over Israel. 
Never mind the grave assault on academic freedom committed here when entire departments, 150 departments and programs, pledge themselves to a political position about which Carrie Nelson has written quite eloquently. It's worse. As Hamas openly pursues its openly declared effort to murder as many Jews as possible, these scholars declare there's nothing controversial here. There's no conflict here. There's not two sides to the issue. It's not two sides to the issue of whether it's acceptable to murder as many Jews as possible. Um, it's stunning. It's stunning. And uh, jumping on the bandwagon finally were, of course, some 200 scholars of Jewish studies and of Israel studies. Um, whose statement was ultimately just as heinous in my eyes uh, as all of the rest of these. And, and since time is short, I'll just focus on one aspect of that. Um, they, um, yeah, I'll skip a bunch here. Uh, but basically what, if you read their statement carefully, uh, Israel is not permitted to defend itself from mass murder attempts by fighting back. It's not permitted to enforce its ethnicity neutral laws or to maintain public order. So Jews, in other words, are not merely not permitted any form of sovereignty, but are not permitted even to live here. And indeed, they describe Zionism in their statement. Uh, it amounts in their view to quote, unjust enduring and unsustainable systems of Jewish supremacy, ethno-national segregation, discrimination and violence against Palestinians. And there's many things wrong with that statement, but I'll just mention Jewish supremacy. Goebbels would be proud. And this, from scholars of Jewish and Israel studies as rockets rain down on Jewish heads and as Jews are being assaulted in the streets of North America and Europe. Um, stunning, uh, and one doesn't know what to make of all of that. Um, lots of analysis available. As to what to expect in the coming year, there is no question as in 2014, the last major flare up, there was a huge wave of BDS resolutions on campuses, et cetera. Word on the street already, they're gearing up. Um, there's no question we're going to see another huge wave of that, but what you have here, which strikes me as really unprecedented, both in its quantity and its quality, is the role of the faculty here. The faculty members who put out these statements, who sign these statements en masse, so divorced from the truth, so divorced from scholarly standards, this, as Hamas commits war crimes, they're coming to the defense of Hamas. That's the only way to read all of this. Uh, and with that kind of faculty support and endorsement, the students are just going to go wild in the year ahead. So I think we are in for a very, very long and difficult year, those of us who keep an eye on or are affiliated with campuses, which are probably most of us in this audience. Um, as I mentioned, I could talk about a little bit of good news, but then that good news is also ultimately bad news. So I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Andy. And, and I'm sorry that my internet uh, cut out. Uh, uh, right at the start of the talk, luckily, uh, my colleagues were able to pinch hit there. Um, you know, I, I felt that in the last um, uh, some weeks, AN was a bit of a therapy group. Um, we were serving that role for so many of our faculty members who were really dejected, uh, dismayed, demoralized, and, and you, you've mentioned it. And um, and I've also seen um, so many members, uh, many on this call among you, Andy, um, step up and, and speak out, um, write counter petitions. We have so many um, that are emerging now, organizing faculty and colleagues, um, writing to administrators, um, writing op-eds in dissent. Um, and so I want, I want to um, just, you know, congratulate those on the call as well for um, um, doing such a service for students um, who really needed that support in the last in the last few weeks. Um, thank you so much um, for for laying it all out for us. Um, so we have hit uh, one thirty, which I, in, in a sense, suspected that would happen with six incredible speakers. Um, it is the end of the official program. Um, we're going to turn off the recording in a minute. Um, our panelists have agreed to stay. As I mentioned, we are saving the chat and actually the chat was very rich and panelists were engaging with, with the audience members already in the chat. Um, but for those that do need to leave, um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I wanna officially just thank our terrific um, speakers today, uh, Donna and Chuck and Oren and Richard and Andy and Ellie, um, you gave 
really rich, thoughtful presentations. And um, we're really grateful to have the opportunity to, to learn from you. Uh, come fall, as all of you mentioned, um, I think you'll be able to bring a lot of these insights into the classroom, into the quad, into professional associations, into conversations with colleagues and university leaders uh, and beyond. Um, so thank you so much. Again, we'll stay on a little bit longer. Um, and those who have to leave, have a very good rest of your day. <laughs>